hits. I'm Nikki Strong. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, Ashley and I will bring you stories along with Brian Lynn. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first... Many school teachers in the United States are choosing not to return to the classroom this year because of the coronavirus health crisis. Now, schools around the country are looking to find substitute teachers. In some places, officials are lowering requirements to help get substitutes in classrooms. Several states have seen an increase in educators seeking retirement or taking time off from work. That is putting more pressure on school workers in places that were already dealing with a lack of teachers and substitutes. Among those leaving is Kay Orzekowitz, an English teacher at Northwest Indiana's Griffith High School. The 57-year-old had hoped to teach for a few more years. But she felt her school's leadership did not fully support using recommended social distancing rules. She worried the school would not provide enough safety equipment to students and teachers. With the technology requirements and the pressure to record classes on video, Orzekowitz said, It just wasn't what I signed up for when I became a teacher. Teachers in at least three states have died after being infected with COVID-19 since the start of the new school year. It is unclear how many teachers in the U.S. have become ill with the disease. But Mississippi alone has reported at least 604 cases among teachers and other school workers. Some teachers could face pressure to return to the classroom after being exposed to the coronavirus. The administration of President Donald Trump has declared teachers to be critical infrastructure workers. Officials in Indiana report that they have received more than 600 teacher retirements since July. Studies suggest more teachers could retire this year than usual, said Trish Whitcomb. She is executive director of the Indiana Retired Teachers Association. Whitcomb said, I've gotten more teachers calling me back saying, well, I'm going to go ahead and retire. Some still wanted to go back in the classroom, but they didn't think the risk was worth it. They looked at their grandkids and the life they have, and I think they're saying, I'm just not going to do it. In Salt Lake County, Utah, more than 80 teachers have either resigned or retired early because of concerns about COVID-19 in schools. More than half of those happened in one of the county's five school districts, Granite School District. All of the district's teachers who left were fined $1,000 for failing to let officials know they were leaving at least 30 days before. Mike McDonough is president of the Granite Education Association Teachers Union. He said, Teachers are resigning over concerns about how the schools have reopened. In Granite, most students will return to in-person classes for four days a week. 
there are few ways for teachers to give only online instruction. Some teachers waited to leave until just before school started in hopes that the district would change its reopening plan. But leaving the classroom was the only way to keep themselves safe, McDonough said. He added, I have heard from teachers that are just heartbroken to leave the classroom, but they didn't feel safe going back. They don't want that level of risk and they have no other choice but to get out. Education leaders in states including Arizona, Kansas, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and Texas have said they are preparing for worsening teacher shortages. The Missouri Board of Education has made it easier to become a substitute teacher under an emergency rule. Instead of 60 hours of college credit, new substitutes now only need to have a high school diploma, complete a 20-hour online training class, and pass a background check. The state of Iowa also eased college class requirements and lowered the working age for new substitutes. The deaths of hundreds of elephants in Botswana earlier this year may have been the result of the animals drinking water containing poisonous blue-green algae. Algae are simple plants with no leaves or stems that grow in or near water. About 330 elephants in the northwestern Saronga area died from a neurological condition. The cause appeared to be drinking toxic water, said Cyril Taulo. He is acting director of the Department of Wildlife and National Parks. A toxic flowering of cyanobacterium was found in seasonal water sources in the area. Botswana's government announced the finding Monday. The unexplained deaths stopped after the water sources, or pans, dried up, Taulo told reporters in Botswana's capital of Khabarone. The Saronga area is close to Botswana's famous Okavango Delta. No other wildlife species were affected by the toxic water. Even animals like hyenas and vultures that were observed feeding on the elephant bodies showed no signs of illness, Taulo said. Botswana has the world's largest elephant population. An estimated 130,000 elephants can be found in the country. The animals bring many international tourists to Botswana. Both male and female elephants of all ages died. The deaths happened mainly near seasonal water pans. The incidents did not spread outside the affected area, Paolo said. After the mysterious deaths of the elephants, the government carried out extensive tests. The aim was to find out why the animals had died. The test results suggested that the elephants died from cyanobacterium, or blue-green algae, poisoning. Taulo said neurotoxins from cyanobacteria living in affected water could have affected the brain signals of an animal. This might have caused paralysis and death, mostly related to breathing failure. However, Taulo could not explain why the toxins did not affect any other animals drinking the affected water.
A rights group has called on social media companies to save images and video that could be used as evidence to investigate serious crimes. Companies like Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter are removing material thought to be offensive or illegal. Human Rights Watch says in a new report. It noted that such material could be presented as evidence at trials for persons accused of war crimes or other charges. The group said it understands why social media companies see the need to remove some material, including content that supports or incites violence. But it is urging the companies to collect and save such material for possible use in criminal cases. In addition to using human monitors, social media services are increasingly turning to machine learning methods to remove content that violates their policies. Human rights researchers fear that the use of machines without human intervention could lead to important evidence being lost or destroyed. Belkis Villa is a Human Rights Watch researcher and helped prepare the new report. She told VOA that videos and images from social media are often used in many of her group's investigations. What we started to notice in the last few years, particularly since 2017, is that we would see a video of, let's say, soldiers executing someone or an Islamic State propaganda video. If, 15 minutes or an hour later, we went back to look at a video again, it was suddenly gone, Villa said. The report noted video evidence collected from social media by the international investigative group Bellingcat. These videos showed a Russian book ground-to-air missile launcher. International investigators say the device was used to fire the weapon that brought down Malaysian Airlines Flight MH17. The flight crashed in eastern Ukraine on July 17, 2014. All 298 people on the airplane were killed. The Dutch-led Joint Investigation Team later presented the videos as evidence. Russia has denied involvement in the incident. Belkis Villa said that during Bellingcat's investigation, the group went to look for evidence it had found earlier on social media, but the material had been removed. Governments are putting increasing pressure on online companies to remove offensive, illegal, or dangerous material from the Internet. Social media companies promised to do more to block extremist content after the live streaming on Facebook of a terror attack on two Islamic centers in New Zealand in 2019. Fifty-one people died in the attack. Social media companies have told Human Rights Watch they are required by law to remove material that could be offensive or incite terror, violence, or hatred. Villa told VOA that the removal systems are now so effective that they are taking down content the minute it gets posted, so no user actually gets to see that content before it comes down.
Syrian Archive is using social media videos to document possible war crimes, including the use of chemical weapons. The rights group has also raised concerns about important evidence being removed from social media before it can be saved and examined. Villa said that one solution could be the creation of an international registry or archive system for collecting online images and video. I'm Brian Lynn. From VOA Learning English, welcome to the Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. In 1823, President James Monroe introduced one of the most important foreign policy decisions in American history. It became known as the Monroe Doctrine. The doctrine said the United States never had and never would take part in any war between the European powers. At the same time, it warned the Europeans against interfering in the Western Hemisphere. Monroe declared that the Americas are not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. Historian Harlow Giles Unger says the Monroe Doctrine marked the end of the colonial era. The United States now considered the entire Western Hemisphere our sphere of influence, but we will keep out of their affairs, but they must keep out of our affairs. The United States continued to grow. New states joined the Union. Indiana, Mississippi, Illinois, and Alabama all became states before 1820. Louisiana had earlier become the first state to be formed from part of the Louisiana Territory that the United States bought from France. The rest of this huge area was called the Missouri Territory. By 1819, there were enough people in part of the Missouri Territory for that part to become the state of Missouri. But becoming a state required the approval of Congress. And historian Harlow Giles Unger says admitting Missouri would have changed the balance of power in the Senate. The Senate gave each state two votes. And by convention, since the signing of the Constitution, the Senate was evenly divided between slave states and non-slave states. So the admission of Missouri would have added a slave state to the, uh, the Senate and left the northern non-slave states as a minority, and they were not going to accept this. Slaves were not new in America. Spain had brought them to the West Indies hundreds of years before. In 1619, a ship brought 20 African slaves to Jamestown, Virginia, these black men were sold to farmers. Over the years, the use of slaves spread to all the American colonies. However, there were many more slaves in the agricultural South than in the North. The farms in the North were smaller and needed less labor. But in the South, farms were much larger Slaves were the least expensive form of labor. Most of the northern states had passed laws before 1800 freeing slaves. Even the southern states made it illegal to import more slaves from Africa. But those southerners who already owned slaves believed they were necessary and they refused to free them. Slavery had been legal when France and Spain controlled the Louisiana Territory. 
the United States did nothing to change this when it purchased the territory. So slavery was permitted in the Missouri Territory at the time Missouri asked for statehood. A New York congressman, James Talmadge, offered an amendment to Missouri's request to become a state. Talmadge proposed that no more slaves be brought into Missouri and that the children of slaves already there be freed at the age of 25. His proposal started a debate that lasted a year. Supporters of Talmadge argued that his proposed amendment was constitutional. The Constitution, they said, gave Congress the right to admit new states into the Union. This also meant, they said, that Congress could refuse to admit new states unless these states met conditions demanded by Congress. Supporters of the amendment also said small farmers of the North and East could not compete with the Southern farmers and the free labor of slaves. They argued that these Northern and Eastern farmers had as much right to the land of Missouri as anyone else. The Louisiana Territory had been paid for by the taxes of all Americans. Those opposed to slavery also argued that slaveholding states would be given too great a voice in the government if Missouri joined them. Under the Constitution, only three out of every five slaves were counted in the national population. The census, taken every ten years, is used to set the number of members for each state in the House of Representatives. In the House, unlike the Senate, the number of votes that a state has is based on its population. In the past, each time a slave state was admitted to the Union, a free state had also been admitted. Harlow Giles Unger explains what the supporters of the amendment may have been thinking. Uh, the problem basically was not so much a moral problem from their point of view. It was much moral as it was economic because the uh, northern states could not compete uh, with southern states. Northern states paid their labor by the peace. In the South, slave labor was free of charge. So the South had a tremendous economic advantage. They could produce goods at much lower cost than the North. And the advent of a majority in the Senate would have tilted the balance of power. Southerners had an answer for each argument of those supporting the Talmadge Amendment. They agreed that Congress had the constitutional right to admit or reject a state. But they said Congress did not have the right to make conditions for a territory to become a state. William Pinckney of Maryland argued that states already in the Union had joined without any conditions. If Congress, he declared, had the right to set conditions for new states, then these new states would not be equal to the old ones. The United States would no longer be a union of equal states. The debate was intense on both sides. The House of Representatives passed the Missouri bill with the Talmadge Amendment, but the Senate rejected it. The people of Missouri would try again for statehood when the new Congress met in 1820. By this time, another free state was ready to enter the Union. Maine, with the permission of Massachusetts, asked to become a separate state. The Senate joined the Maine bill with the one for unconditional statehood for Missouri. Senators refused to separate the two, and so they continued to debate about conditions 
for statehood and slavery. Finally, Senator Jesse Thomas of Illinois offered a compromise. He said Maine could be admitted as a free state and Missouri as a state permitting slavery. But he said that no other state allowing slavery could be formed from the northern part of the Louisiana Territory. Many Southerners were not satisfied. The compromise closed the door against slavery entering large new areas of land. Southerners, like any other Americans, had a right to settle in the new territory. The Senate accepted Thomas's compromise. Congress approved statehood for both Missouri and Maine. Now President Monroe just needed to sign the bills. It was the spring of 1820. James Monroe was coming to the end of his first four years as president. He wanted to be elected again, but he faced a difficult decision about whether to allow the Missouri Compromise. President Monroe owned slaves. He understood the feelings of the South. His friends urged him to veto the Compromise Bill because it limited slavery in the territory. He also understood the strong feelings of those who opposed slavery. Monroe believed the Compromise was wrong, but not because it kept slaves out of the territory. The President did not believe the Constitution gave Congress the right to make such conditions. Monroe even wrote a veto message explaining why he could not approve the compromise, but in the end, he did not use his veto. He believed there might be civil war if he rejected the compromise. So Monroe signed the bill. Missouri had permission to enter the Union as a slave state. The crisis seemed to end. But a few months later, a new problem developed. Missouri wrote a state constitution that it sent to Congress for approval. One part of this constitution did not permit free black men to enter the state. A number of lawmakers in Congress immediately opposed the state constitution. They said it violated the United States Constitution. The United States Constitution said citizens of each state had the same rights as citizens of each of the other states. And since free black men were citizens of some states, they should have the right to be citizens of Missouri. The debate lasted several months. Former House Speaker Henry Clay finally proposed a compromise that both sides accepted. Missouri could become a state if its legislature would make this promise. It would never pass any law that would violate the rights of any citizen of another state. This second compromise ended the dispute over slavery in Missouri and the Louisiana Territory. The Compromise Actions of 1820 settled the crisis of slavery for more than 20 years. But everyone knew that the settlement was only temporary. Former President Thomas Jefferson expressed his feelings with these words. This momentous question, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at once as the knell of the Union. It is hushed, indeed, for the moment. But this is a reprieve only, he said, not a final sentence. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.